very much, Terry, for that presentation. You mentioned uh, uh, the UBC proposal, and I should add that it will be discussed in more detail, but I think he must have later. I would only add at this point that let's not forget that if it did go to UBC, that is an institution owned by everybody in the province. It's a responsible institution. If it's acceptable, I don't know the details. Vicky will be discussing them, and there are more, obviously more discussion to come. But um, that may be a way out which deals with the whole of the land, which, uh, which uh, uh, Terry so correctly uh, pointed out, uh, needs to be dealt in a holistic fashion. You can't just deal with it. So I think that uh, we're going to be listening to, to Vicky um, later on on the, uh, uh, the, the UBC proposal with some interest. Before she gets on, however, Calvin Sanborn is the legal director of UBIC Environmental Law Clinic and has a long history um, as a, an activist and a great spokesperson on environmental issues. And he is going to go into the Auditor General Report and uh, explain some of the uh, complications of it, some of the difficulties of it, but also, I'm sure, it will point out to us uh, how important such an impartial working person view of this decision actually is. The criticism, I have to say, I'm the Indian, well, I have rarely seen anything from that step. So, Calvin, I'm going to listen to this great question. Thanks, David. Nothing that I can say up here can be as important as your presence here. What a crowd. You know, I, when Vic told me about this meeting, I said, you're going to do this at S.J. Willis? That's a big hall. And here we are filling this hall with this meeting. Thank you. But why is it that we fill the hall? Why is it that we have this crowd here that such a diverse crowd of First Nations, and trade unionists, and environmentalists, and surfers, and pensioners, and blue collar workers, and professionals, and politicians, ex-politicians, and average people, all of us uh, Canadian hockey fans. Why, why are we all here? It's because we not only want to own the podium, we want to own nature. We want to own the Victoria as well. So, Ray Zimmerman came to us a couple of years ago at the Environmental Law Clinic, and he said, you've got to do something about the fact that these TFO names have been deleted from the tree programs. And so, our students started looking at this issue, and they discovered that Collier's real estate company was advertising those areas in red on the map there. And, and you know, the real poets of our time are real estate agents. And, and this is what those ads said. And there's some truth to it. The, the, the ad said, British Columbia's most amazing land with waterfront views, development potential, and timber value. And another one of the ads said, one of the single greatest opportunities on Vancouver Island to acquire a prominent stretch of predominantly undeveloped coastline. And the, the real punchline ad was, this is the next Tofino Euclid corridor. It's a hidden jewel from the rest of the world. And those were the ads that went out to the United States and England and Germany and France saying, we're going to sell this hidden jewel. But Ray Zimmerman said, no, I, I want to own the issue. So these uh, law students at the University of Washington started doing some investigations. And they looked at the government documents that they could get a hold of. And they, they noticed this curious thing, that this land had been taken out of the tree farm license, and Western Forest Products had not paid compensation for. The other thing they discovered was that in the past, when lands were removed from tree farm licenses, companies had paid. This was very curious. And the reason why compensation was paid was that tree farm licenses back in the 1950s 
were set up after Justice Sloan did his Royal Commission on Forestry. And he said, if we want to have ongoing forestry in this province, of course, that we should set up tree farm licenses that would be permanent tree farm licenses, so we would have forests forever. And the deal was that the companies would put in a little bit of their private land, and then in exchange, they got 10 times as much, typically, 10 times as much crown timber. So it was a pretty good deal for those companies because they got way more crown timber than they could get off of their own private lands, and they got subsidies, and they got tax breaks. So a precedent was set so that in the 1990s, lands were deleted from tree farm licenses, but companies had to pay for those deletions from the tree farm license. In 1999, timber was $10 million for some deleted lands. And then uh, again in 1999, McMillan Bodell applied to take lands out of the tree farm license. And they agreed with government that compensation had to be paid. They had an appraiser look at the land, and the appraiser said, if the film Bodell gets that land out, they should pay $18 million. And that deal was going ahead. But you see, back in 1999, the government actually did public consultation. They went out to hearings, and the public resoundingly said, no damn way should you take that land for tree farm prices. So that deal never went through. So in 2004, excuse me, excuse me, uh, that there was another application to take that land out, the same $18 million land that the Mobile Bell had previously wanted, uh, to take that land out of the tree plant license. And uh, the students discovered a cabinet briefing note, which in the cabinet briefing note uh, from civil servants to cabinet said, uh, well, there's compensation payable for this kind of deletion. Uh, because of the fact that uh, the government had given the company massive timber rights, and, and because it just makes sense to pay compensation uh, because you were undoing a contract with a company that already got a lot of benefit. And so the, uh, if you're deleting the TFL lands, the government loses the, the TFL lands, the private lands that were, have been managed as crown lands for decades. And yet the company gets keep its access to the far larger amount of crown land. So what we were looking at here with this most recent deletion was that the company got its private lands out of the crown managed tree farm licenses and they got to keep access to the much larger area of crown timber. So as one of my students put it to me, she said, oh, I mean they get to keep their cake and eat it too. And, and that really kind of sums it up. So, the, the odd thing was that if the, if the government had sought compensation, as uh, the precedents indicated, uh, the government could have gotten Jordan River as a park. They could have gotten Sand Cut Beach as a park. There were a number of other resource or recreation sites in that land that could have been given to government as compensation, but it didn't happen. And if government had, uh, had actually bargained to get compensation, they might have gotten land for treaty processes, might have gotten land for environmental protection, and so forth. Now, the other thing that the, the students noticed was that, uh, that there was this curious lack of consultation. Because in the past, like in 1999, when government thought about taking the land up, David Perry did hearings all over Vancouver Island, and they got an earful about the idea of taking the land up. Well, in this case, there was no consultation whatsoever. They didn't tell the capital region this way. They didn't tell the public. But actually, there was some consultation because Western Forest Products told their shareholders months before this decision was made in their annual general report. So you see, your problem is that you're not shareholders of Western Forest Products. Otherwise, you might have seen this train coming down the track. Um, but because there was no proper consultation, it meant that the Capital Regional District was taken by surprise. 